Uh, so I want to welcome Dr. Day Rep and Dr. Graves to give our seminar series today on nearly everything you learned about race in medical school is wrong, if that is the correct title. And um, I'll start with introducing uh, Andrea Day Rep. Uh, Dr. Day Rep received her undergrad degree from Princeton University and did her MD, PhD and pathology residency at University of Chicago. She was, I didn't know this, she was a Sharon Weiss soft tissue, I knew you were soft tissue, but I didn't know you worked with Dr. Weiss, a soft tissue pathology fellow at Emory. But since about 2015, she's really focused her career on medical education, um, joining Duke as the course director of the first year medical school pathology, where she currently is as a, as a full professor. Um, this is how I met her in the education realm. And she and I have been on council for the undergraduate medical education Council for the Association of Path Pathology Chairs um, for many years together. And I hope that in part the council was somewhat influential in her absolute dedication and examining the use of race in medical education. She was a 2021 Duke uh, Teaching for Equity Fellows in the uh, Teach Teaching for Equity Fellows program, a member of the Duke School of Medicine Health Professions Anti-Racism Task Force, and is one of the co-editors of the new Robbins Pathology textbook, Essential Pathology. Um, of the, and the upcoming edition of the uh, Robinson Coomer Basic Pathology, which is what our medical students use here. She is actively committed to anti-racism efforts into improving discussion of healthcare disparities in medical education. She, uh, and she has as much of her work on a wonderful website and I'll include that in the link um, in the chat. So you can go check that out. She's got some great little podcasts and things. So welcome Dr. Dayrep. Um, Dr. Graves, Dr. Joseph Graves is a professor of biological sciences at the North Carolina Agriculture and, and Technical State University. He received his PhD in environmental ev evolutionary and systematic biology from Wayne State University. Um, and his research is in the evolutionary genomics of adaptation, how it shapes our understanding of biological aging and bacterial response to nanomaterials, which sounds like a wonderful talk in and of itself. Multiple books on the biology of race, including The Emperor's New Clothes, Biological Theories of Race at the Millennium, The Race Myth, Why We Pretend Race Exists in America, and Race and Racism, Answers to Frequently Asked Questions. He leads many programs addressing underrepresentation of minorities in science and is very active in his local community um, with this. So thank you so much to both of you. And I will turn it over. Um, for a presentation and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. And I will say our audience is, is largely our Department of Pathology, which is mixed between clinical and research faculty, and then some uh, people from our Department of Education who, who uh, were able to make it. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you so very much, uh, Robin. Uh, we are both absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, our talk has continued to evolve over the last uh, year and a half, and I think this is a really uh, nice iteration for you. So the new title, uh, which um, has become something of a, um, a refrain for Dr. Graves and myself, is nearly everything you learned about race in medical school is wrong. So we'll begin with a disclosure, which is, as you mentioned, I'm a co-editor author of two of the Robbins Pathology textbooks, Robbins Essential Pathology and the upcoming Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. And I'm absolutely delighted that we brought on Dr. Graves as a paid consultant for Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology to help us uh, to address race uh, in this text. So over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we're going to discuss the impact of systemic racism in medical school curricula, compare and contrast biological and socially defined race, evaluate disparities in the pathophysiology of disease, and describe an approach to addressing health disparities in medical education. So how does race show up in the curriculum? Well, I'm a pathologist, I'm a course director, and Robbins is the book we use. And so in order to get an idea of the depth and breadth of the problem, I did a search of the electronic uh, version of the book using terms like Caucasian and African and Asian. And I found more than uh, 40 diseases for which some sort of disparity was associated with socially defined race. Uh, so let's take a look at how this shows up in the actual textbook. So here are some quotations from uh, Robin's 10th edition, looking at uh, cardiac amyloidosis in African-Americans, uh, carrier frequency of cystic fibrosis in Caucasians, cholesterol gallstones in Native Americans, and factor V Leiden mutation in whites. Now, just for the, you know, the, the outset, let's just set aside the outdated terminology because that should be easy enough to fix. Let's focus on the fact that when these sentences were written, 
They were written with the best of intentions, with the idea that these future physicians would use these epidemiologic data to uh, develop a broad yet focused differential diagnosis, to order and interpret appropriate lab tests, and then to design optimal therapy for their patients. So these sentences were written with the best of intentions. But as you all know, when you're engaged in anti-racism, it's not enough to simply say, well, I had good intentions. We have to ask, are we causing harm? And I think we are. And there are three areas I'd like to address. And the first of these is something I call buzzword bingo. So we take very motivated, very bright medical students who are very good at multiple choice questions, and we teach them simple word associations like white, cystic fibrosis, black, sickle cell disease. And we reinforce this through multiple choice questions, clinical vignettes, uh, preparation for the boards, and then the step exams themselves. So let's take a look at what some of this board prep might look like. Uh, this comes from a 2015 website, uh, crashingresident.com, so only a short uh, seven uh, years ago. And this is one of the suggestions that the author makes for uh, students preparing to take step one, be as racist as possible. And as your eyes glide over the associations here, uh, I think you will recognize, certainly the, the older attendings, that this, these are the things that we learned for the boards. Uh, these are the same associations I learned at University of Chicago 20 years ago. Now let's look at something a little bit more recent and perhaps a little bit more scientific. Uh, this is uh, from a 2017 paper by Rip and Braun. Now we can't look at the actual MBME test questions, obviously they're proprietary, but we can look at the next best thing. And so what these two authors did was they got uh, a subscription to UWorld and looked at the question bank for step one. And what they did was to query uh, the database to look for mentions of race and ethnicity. And they used uh, the ones that are listed here. And they further categorized them as to whether they were descriptive, so completely uh, unimportant to coming up with the correct answer, or whether they were central, that knowing that individual's race or ethnicity was going to help you get the correct answer. And they found, uh, as you can see here, here are their data. And there are a couple of points I'd like to focus on. So one is uh, we see here that the white slash Caucasian group um, is uh, about 93% of the time, it's purely descriptive. It's just incidental. The person just happens to be white. And only about 7% of the time is that central. And that's uh, typically for something, uh, one of the most common ones was uh, coronary artery disease. And interestingly, none of the other socially defined races had coronary artery disease. Now, as we look at this, we see that uh, 407 of the total mentions were for this group. That's 86% of the time that race or ethnicity is mentioned. So that's a really um, uh, significant amount, particularly when you compare that to the actual proportion of this socially defined race in the United States. So about 62% uh, in the 2020 census. But even more egregious, I think, is if you look at the Native American category. So if a Native American shows up in your vignette, Right? It's not because uh, the, that person was in a, a motor vehicle accident or brushed up against poison ivy. They are there specifically because they're Native American. So it could be something like uh, severe combined immunodeficiency or lactase deficiency. Interestingly, uh, in the, uh, the opposite of coronary artery disease, which is only seen apparently in whites and Caucasians, uh, lactase deficiency is seen in all the other groups uh, uh, as well. So. The question here is, are we causing harm? And you may be saying, well, you know, these are just the preclinical years. And, you know, surely our students are going to learn when they go onto the wards and they become residents and attendings, they're going to see the vast spectrum of health and disease, and they're going to recognize that it's much more subtle than this. And I will tell you that there are things that I learned 20 plus years ago at the University of Chicago that I did not learn were false until I began really looking at race and medicine because it gets passed on from generation to generation. So the next question we have is how about patient harm? Are we causing patient harm? And again, my answer is, yeah, I think so. I think we could be. So take, for example, a young uh, Navajo woman presents with right upper quadrant pain and the attendee looks at her and says, Native American, it's got to be gallstones, and doesn't think ectopic pregnancy or acute appendicitis, either of which can kill the patient. Now, again, you may be saying, well, you know, no need to worry. We've got algorithms. We've got checks and balances. And I will share with you now uh, an anecdote from the literature. Uh, this is from uh, 
the article, The Misuse of Race and Medical Diagnosis, in which the author recounts the story of a childhood friend who was not diagnosed with cystic fibrosis until she was eight. Now, the usual diagnosis is going to be in the first couple of months uh, of birth, right? So this is a very delayed diagnosis. Uh, and in fact, this patient, despite presenting multiple times with suspicious symptoms, uh, was only diagnosed at the age of eight by a radiologist who could not see the color of her skin and just looked at the chest film and said, hey, who's the kid with cystic fibrosis? So finally, as long as we're looking, I think we need to take another step back and say, is there a way we are causing societal harm by having these associations with race and disease? Is there a way we are taking one population and lifting it up and taking another population and pushing it down saying, you know, bad genes, risky behavior, non-compliant. Is there a way we are setting up subtly or not so subtly a hierarchy? So to make that easy for you to see, I'm going to redline for you all of the diseases in Robbins for which there is a, a greater incidence or worse prognosis in individuals of African descent. And for comparison, you can see the diseases where that holds true for individuals of European descent. So clearly race is playing a big role here, but let's take a moment and think, what do we mean when we talk about race? I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Graves. Um, thank you, Dr. Dara. So the elephant in the living room, what exactly do we mean by race? In modern biology, uh, races are defined by two criteria. The first is the amount of genetic variation within and between groups in a species. And the second is whether you can demonstrate in a species whether any group can be considered a unique um, evolutionary lineage. Now, it's long been known that in humans, um, there's more variability within the so-called races than between them. And while we have geographically based genetic and physical differences, um, all humans uh, share 99.9% .9 of their DNA or of their genome. Now, um, not to confuse folks, um, when you're talking about 3.3 billion base pairs, there's clearly enough um, genetic variation left for individuals to all be unique and for there to be some geographical variation in the frequency of alleles. However, if you were to choose any two people at random um, in Africa and one person at random from Europe and one person at random from Africa, it turns out that the European and the African are far more likely to share genes in common than the two Africans are. And that's because Africa has the greatest amount of genetic variation within our species. Next slide, please. So biological races simply do not exist in modern humans using you know, modern biological criteria, of unique phylogenetic lineages or the amount of genetic variation. On the other hand, socially constructed or socially defined race arbitrarily utilizes aspects of morphology, geography, culture, language, religion, but only does so in the service of a social dominance hierarchy. In other words, racism created our conceptions of socially defined race. And it's not just me and my colleague, Helen Goodman, who thinks so. The reason I was late uh, signing on today is because I was just writing a review of another book um, by Ian Tattersall and uh, his colleague um, saying exactly what we say. Uh, you know, socially defined races are real, biological races do not exist. Now this is again, getting wider recognition as Merrill 2017's introduction to epidemiology, they say, race is a socially constructed variable based on the idea that some human populations are distinct from others according to external physical characteristics or places of origin. Now, they go on to say, racial or ethnic variations in health-related states or events are slain primarily by exposure or vulnerability to behavioral, psychosocial, material, or environmental risk factors and resources. Note that they do not say that these variations are primarily due to genomic or genetic differences between these groups. Next slide. And you know the confusion about biological and social conceptions is well illustrated in the US Census Bureau categories. For example, white, a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, 
the Middle East or North Africa, which begs the question, how much ancestry in these regions do you have to have before you become white? And of course, you probably all know that the history of whiteness in the United States has shifted through time so that some areas of Europe weren't even considered white um, less than a century ago. Black or African-American, a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. Once again, we get to the fundamental question of, well, how much of that ancestry makes you black? Now, historically in the United States, it was any detectable African ancestry or knowledge of African ancestry that made you black. And that was by law throughout the United States. And of course, in the modern sense, this idea is even less useful when you consider that the continent of Africa has more genetic variability than all the rest of the world. Now, Alaska Indian or Alaska, American Indian or Alaska Native, person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America, including Central America, but the key here is, and who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment. So by simply leaving your tribe or you know, leaving the community, you're no longer considered a mere Indian or Alaska Native, even if your parents were. Asian, person having origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or in the Indian subcontinent, including, and you can read all the countries yourself. And you know, my response to that is you're talking about a huge geographical expanse. And yes, um, these populations do differ by geography in the frequency of alleles within them. So, you know, using this as a description of a group of people when they're radically different cultures, religions, and so on, it seems to be rather nonsensical. Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, a person having origins in the original peoples of Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, and other Pacific Islands. And here, this is probably of all these categories the ones that make that makes the most sense, but even this is flawed um, in ways that I've described already. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, Dr. Graves has just been talking about race and the way that you see it was you know, largely geographic. So let's do a little geography and let's tie it to medicine. So this is a map showing uh, the distribution of a variety of hemoglobinopathies. Uh, now, as you all know, right, hemoglobinopathies uh, developed and flourished in the context of malaria. So there's a heterozygous advantage in thalassemia and hemoglobin S, hemoglobin C, that is protective against malaria. So if we look at this map, we can say that, for example, in that um, uh, crashing the boards uh, advice on be as racist as possible mentioned, you know, thalassemia is seen uh, in Asians. Well, yes, yes, it is seen in some Asians, but there are an awful lot of Asians in which you don't see this. So you can't say anything meaningful about Asians. Uh, let's look at Africa, right? We always associate uh, sickle cell disease. That is the African-American disease. Well, as you can see, there certainly are some areas uh, where we do have hemoglobin S uh, in Africa, but we also see it in Southern Europe, in the Middle East, and in India. And if by focusing solely on this as being the African-American disease, we could very well be missing this, not screening for it, not noticing it in uh, patients from other backgrounds uh, in our community. But I think what really brings us home, the fact that these diseases are associated with geographical issues and exposure to pathogens, is this big uh, empty area here uh, in the uh, north of Africa, right? There are, are no hemoglobinopathies here. And this is something that's not respecting you know, geography uh, or respecting uh, political boundaries. This is where the Sahara Desert is, right? So no water, no mosquitoes, no malaria, no hemoglobinopathies. So this is just demonstrating for us the foolishness of associating uh, diseases with certain uh, ethnicities uh, or countries of origin. Let's focus again here on, uh, on Africa, uh, because that is uh, sickle cell disease is talked about so much uh, in medical school uh, and in race-based medicine. Uh, we can see here we have uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, a fair amount of hemoglobin S and some hemoglobin C. 
And if we were to compare that to a map uh, showing the origin of enslaved peoples and the history of our country, you could see that even if you didn't know very much about modern America, you would expect that we would have a reasonable amount of hemoglobin S because that area is where um, many enslaved people originated as well as hemoglobin C. And you would be right. So this is just data from a one uh, study. It's a sickle cell screening clinic uh, at Howard University. And you can see here that while most of the individuals have uh, uh, wild type hemoglobin A, about 10% have sickle cell trait. We also have some hemoglobin C. So you may be thinking, okay, I'm putting the story together. I'm thinking about uh, you know, the ancestry of my patients, uh, but there's something to keep in mind, and that is that we have to deal with two other issues. One is recurrent uh, immigration waves, as well as population admixture. So the uh, prevalence of sickle cell trait in the United States is about eight to 10%. And if you look at sickle cell trait uh, in Western Africa, it ranges from 15 to 28%. Now, why is this? Part of the reason is that there continues to be pressure from malaria in this area. So these uh, individuals who are coming to our country are going to have a different uh, genetic background because of this pressure. And this is relevant because a rising share of the US black population is foreign born. So about 9% are immigrants. So you can't look at someone and know uh, whether they are descendant from chattel slaves or whether they come from a recent immigration wave, an area that may or may not uh, have uh, exposure to malaria. And then this brings us again to the issue of population admixture, because the mean amount of uh, European ancestry is about 16% for African Americans, defined as Americans descended from enslaved persons. And understanding population admixture is extremely important, so I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Graves. Got to unmute myself. So when we look at uh people who are socially defined as African-American and look at their actual ancestry, it turns out that the mean amount of European ancestry and people socially defined as African-American is about um, 0.16 or 16%. Now that differs dramatically depending upon which portion of the country you're in. So for example, in West Virginia, the mean European ancestry in persons socially defined as African-American is north of um, 30%. And similarly in Washington state. Next slide, please. Now for Latinos, um, this is even more complex because you're talking about a triad mixture. Now, most of the Latino populations in the United States vary between 65 to 85% European ancestry. But you can see again that this differs dramatically when we look at uh, populations in the Caribbean and South America. Next slide. So for example, in Puerto Rico, um, the mean ancestry, European ancestry is about 72%. Mean Amerindian ancestry is about 16%. And the mean African ancestry is about 12%. Now, consider that, uh, compare that to Mexican Americans who are the largest um, Latino population in the United States. And their mean uh, American Indian ancestry is 51% and a 46% European ancestor, but only a 3% African ancestry. Now in the nation of Peru, they have 80% American Indian ancestry compared to only 18% European and 2% African. Then in Colombia, and Colombia has you know, a, a, a uh, distribution similar to that of Puerto Rico, 64% European, 29% Amerindian, and 7% African. But within the nation itself, the triad mixture can differ dramatically depending upon the location. Next slide. So for example, in the city of Medellin, you see a triad mixture that's very similar to that of the nation as a whole. But in the neighboring state of Choco, the people there have are predominantly African in their ancestry, um, with again more Amer Indian, and this is because Choco was a major site of plantation agriculture that was worked by enslaved Africans, and so within the same country, these people all see themselves as Colombians, and if they came to the United States, however, they would be treated dramatically different. Next slide. Okay, so I think that the visual impact there is 
very useful in helping us to recognize that race is not a biologically useful construct. So why are there racial disparities in health and disease? So there are what we would consider to be the intrinsic causes of disparity. So something genetic based on uh, drift or selection. Uh, so for example, a founder effect or population bottleneck. So this could be severe combined immunodeficiency uh, in the Navajo and Apache populations, uh, or for example, Tay-Sachs in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Uh, but these are populations, not races. Uh, a second cause of intrinsic uh, disparity can be endogamy, which means marriage within, or more specifically, breeding within one's group. And that can be based on religion or caste or geography. And finally, we have selective advantage, for example, what we see uh, with uh, the hemoglobinopathies. And while we spend a lot of time and money, uh, research dollars, trying to tease out these allele frequencies and, and this HLA type, this, that, and the other, what is really driving health disparities are the extrinsic causes. And many of these are linked. So poverty is going to be linked to access to care and living conditions and food access and neighborhood and stress and health insurance. And all of these are affected by individual, institutional, and systemic racism. Now, I know that you guys are very well versed in these terms, but I'm going to take a moment just to go over them so we're all on the same page. This comes from a, an excellent uh, website, dismantlingracism.org, uh, that I highly recommend. And it looks at the three expressions of racism. So uh, for myself, uh, before I really began looking at this, I really thought of racism as being a personal expression. And, and I knew that I wasn't a racist. And I thought of racism as being you know, white men in white robes burning crosses, uh, which is certainly a, a terrifying vision. But it is not the permeation of society, which we see with institutional and cultural racism. So what are these two other types? So institutional racism will be the policies and practices of hospitals, universities uh, that include and serve and protect uh, white individuals at the expense of people of color. And a health uh, example of this would be that when the first uh, PKU uh, testing site was, was initiated, they said, well, we're only going to test white children because um, black kids don't get fetal ketonuria, which of course you know is not true. And then cultural systemic uh, racism has to do with the beliefs, values, and norms of a society that similarly protect, uplift, serve, and financially resource uh, white communities at the ex expense of communities of color. And you know, the obvious example here is that our society does not believe in universal access to health care. And you have to know that, that has the, a huge impact on health disparities. So let's take a look uh, at um, how some of these extrinsic causes uh, work into uh, the health literature. So this is a statement from up to date looking at uh, two uh, studies which are cited below. And as you're aware, if a woman needs a hysterectomy, there are two basic approaches. One is an open hysterectomy, which is an abdominal incision, uh, which has a significant morbidity. Uh, one can't lift heavy objects. Uh, it's difficult to, um, uh, it takes a, a while to recover from that. And then there are minimally invasive techniques like a laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy or a vaginal uh, hysterectomy. And what these two studies showed is that for women who are eligible for either type, uh, if they were uh, Black, Hispanic, or publicly insured, they were less likely to receive a minimally invasive technique compared to white women. Uh, and I would say that the factors involved here are going to be systemic racism because of the link to public insurance, uh, to institutional racism because the hospitals that served these populations had fewer surgeons who did minimally invasive uh, hysterectomies, and then poverty, education, access to care, health insurance uh, all pay, play a part. And then if we look at the sentence from the 10th edition of Robbins, uh, linking the pathologic effects of high blood pressure uh, with uh, socially defined race African Americans, uh, we would say that all of these play a role. Uh, and, and the reason is there is no slavery gene, right? There, there is no uh, gene that causes African-Americans to have hypertension. It's all of these are going to contribute to this. So what do we do, right? So, you know, I don't wanna just tell you, look, there are all these problems. Let's figure out how to fix this. So the first thing, and this is my approach to everything, uh, is a thoughtful, mindful analysis of the material driven by data. Uh, we have to be inclusive so that we are asking the right questions uh, and we have to provide context. So the first question, and I say, I, I suggest whenever you see socially defined race mentioned literature, your first question should be, is it even true? 
And what I did for uh, my medical students uh, of the 40 plus diseases in Robbins for which there was a socially um, a link to socially defined race, I did a deep dive into the literature and that generated about an 85 page uh, document with figures and, and references. And I believe Robin has a copy of it and I'm happy to, to share that freely. Um, and so whenever you see that, do that deep dive. And one of the first questions is, is it even true? So this is a sentence that is in the 10th edition of Robbins uh, talking about uh, the increased risk of uh, keloid formation uh, in individuals of African descent. And so I, uh, I emailed the author of that chapter and I said, you know, I really think you need to remove that part. And his response was a very short email and said, this is what it says and up to date. Well, because I'd made my disparities document for my students, I had actually read up to date and I had even read reference five in addition to about 30 or 40 other references on keloids. When I say deep dive, I mean deep. And what that reference said with by Robles and Berg, it had this five, to, actually had four and a half to 16%, but it uh, had this other statistic that really caught my eye because it says the risk of developing keloids is about 15 times higher in dark skinned individuals compared with whites. Now, 15 times higher is a big number, right? So that's something you think that's got to be you know, statistically significant. But the other reason this ca caught my eye is because I had seen it in four other articles. Now, I believe that this uh, article by Brissett is the index paper. That was the first place I'd seen uh, this particular statistic. Let's see what Brissett and Sheris had to say. Well, this is what they say in that paper from 2001, that in a review of 175 cases of keloids from various races, the authors found that keloids were 15 times more likely to occur in darker skinned individuals. Let's go to that paper by Al-Hadi and Savannah Farah, 1969. They say the relatively fair skinned Chinese appear to be slightly more prone to keloids than the dark skinned Indians and Malays. So the arrow is pointing in the wrong direction and the math is wrong. So I did the math is about two to three fold increase, right? So let's come back to this statistic, this fact, right? Keloids have been reported in five to 16% of individuals of Hispanic and African ancestry. And I can talk to you a little bit more about the Hispanic part. They actually just seem to have been thrown in there. I haven't seen in none of the papers that were cited did they actually look at individuals of Hispanic ancestry. So where did the 16% come from? I kept pulling at this string, going deeper and deeper and deeper, trying to find where this number came from. And here it is. It was first reported May 17th, 1931. Uh, this is uh, from a meeting in Strasbourg of a dermatologic society. Uh, and the actual 16% doesn't come from a presented paper. It comes from the discussion. Uh, the uh, person who presented the original paper, Monsieur Lespin, uh, about uh, tattoos and keloids in uh, Negros of the Congo. And after he finished his presentation, someone leaped up to the microphone, one presumes, as so often happens at meetings, and said, oh, let me take this opportunity to tell you what I have done, not actually asking a question. Uh, and what Monsieur Staub did, uh, he was uh, Belgian, and he was in the Belgian Congo, and he took advantage of the uh, colonial uh, exploitation of mine workers to look at uh, 1,205 um, adult uh, black men who worked in the mines and to look at all of them for keloids. And what he found was that 16% of them had keloids. So there it is, 90 years, uh, almost, almost to the day, uh, we have um, uh, the 16%. But what makes this particularly interesting, right, is that that exact same meeting, there was a presented paper um, by another individual, and this was a guy in Switzerland, um, Monsieur Negley. And what he did is he looked at keloids in Swiss uh, children and adults, uh, so Europeans. And what he found was that 13.3% of Swiss adults had keloids. So if you look at these two facts side by side, right, and we're going to overlook, you know, how you choose your population, all of that. What is so statistically significant or even clinically relevant between 13.3% and 16%? Why did the 16% make it all the way to 2021? I believe it has to do with systemic racism. So I presented all of this to the author, right? Because you have to present a lot of data sometimes to shift the narrative. And this is what we came up with. This is what it will now say in Robbins. Keloid formation seems to be an individual predisposition, which it is, right? But then this drives us to the, the more important question, why are we looking at socially defined race in the first place, right? Why are we tying this even to ancestry and descent? 
If you want to know if someone is going to be prone to keloids, you don't look at the color of their skin, you look at the patient's actual skin, right? So, you know, by the time we're adults, we've had multiple scrapes and cuts, maybe a surgery or two, a piercing, maybe multiple, right? If I'm going to get a keloid, you can look at my skin and see if I'm going to get a keloid. Now, if it's a, a child, uh, you can, I mean, obviously examine the child. I had a pretty traumatic childhood running all over the place. So if I were going to get keloid, I had enough scrapes that I would have had one. But we know that keloids uh, have a family uh, predisposition. So you would look at uh, or ask about the kids, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, cousins, aunts, uncles, uh, grandparents, parents. And that's going to give you a good idea of what that individual's genetic ancestry predisposes them to. And even more than that, not just keloids, not just genetic uh, ancestry, what might be part of their culture. So maybe they're part of a, a community that has a particular food or folk remedy that they use or a particular practice that they do. By asking what are the diseases in your family, you are going to find out more about what that individual has a risk for than anything else. So I put all this into a video. This is my, um, my website that uh, Dr. Legallo mentioned. Uh, and, I, and I kept emailing the people at up to date saying, you know, you need to fix this. Uh, and we, uh, Dr. Graves and I had a, um, uh, an article in New England Journal of Medicine where I again mentioned the fact that up to date was not up to date. This is what uh, it said in uh, November of 2021. And this is what it says now. So, so we've removed that association. So science has prevailed, right? But this brings up the next thing that I have to warn you about for everyone who's interested in fighting race-based medicine is the person who then says, but what about, right? So there was someone who saw our article and wrote a response letter uh, saying, no, no, look, here are these two studies that show that keloids are much more common in African-Americans. Uh, that letter was not published because it had fatal flaws uh, and was not worth publishing, but it's still worth looking at their argument. So here you can see this uh, first study has got um, uh, about 7% African-Americans have keloids compared to 0.5% whites. Uh, this is actually a study, and neither of these two studies describes how they defined race or where it came from. Was it uh, self-description? Was it an administrator? Nothing. And that's particularly interesting because the first study is from Canada. So I don't know, I mean, I know Canada is part of North America, but there are certain associations. But anyway, if you look at the other paper, right? So we have many more and we see a vastly different number. It's still more common in African-Americans than in whites, uh, but the numbers are very different. So this tells you something about the challenge of doing race-based research is that because of we, as we've said, biological race does not exist, doing research looking at socially defined race is fraught with problems. So this brings us to another question, which I've already posed to Dr. Legala, which is even if it's true, is it relevant? So statistical significance does not equal clinical significance. Now, if there's a fourfold difference in one particular population, that could be interesting for guiding research and health policy, right? Um, but do we want to trumpet this, ask medical students to memorize it, and color the way they create differential diagnoses. So here's an example. This uh, will be in the next edition of Robbins, uh, despite um, the efforts of Dr. Graves and myself. Uh, lupus is more common in African-Americans. Now, the difference is one in a thousand European-Americans and four in a thousand African-Americans. So we're talking about a rare disease, right? Is this something that warrants me teaching this to medical students? Will it affect the differential diagnosis they, they devise? Let's look at something even more rare, right? So multiple myeloma, this sentence is also going to be in Robbins. Multiple myeloma is more common in African-Americans. I'm like, we're talking six in 100,000 versus 12 in 100,000. It's a supremely rare disease. Now there is a difference in the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value of tests, right? But when you look at the tests we're using to diagnose these, right? They're not reaching that 90, 99% specificity and sensitivity. So I think that we are, overlooking the value uh, and assigning much more value to race than we should. So this brings us uh, to the question of what is clinically relevant? And this uh, appears in a paper that uh, is actually not yet uh, been uh, published, although it has been released online ahead of print. Uh, it's called Race in the Reading Problems in Pediatrics uh, that uh, I did with a medical student at University of Chicago, Dr. Graves, and a mentor of mine from University of Chicago. And what we did was we took the 2016 American Academy of Pediatrics textbook of pediatric care, about 2000 pages. 
We searched the ebook using 29 terms associated with race and ethnicity, so more robust than what I did for Robbins. And we had 2,100 uh, total results. About 800 of six were relevant for analysis. So we threw out black box warning and black widow spider, things like that. And because the racial statements uh, frequently compared and contrasted multiple races, uh, we had about 235 statements or tables uh, that were available for analysis. And we initially just went through and we coded them as problematic versus non-problematic. And then we came up with seven themes of problematic usage. And we have a, a mnemonic for this, it's SCORISC. And the idea for this is that if you are working on a textbook or a paper and you see race uh, in that, is to ask uh, a series of questions to determine whether race is problematic or not. So this is uh, what the mnemonic stands for, is using race as a surrogate uh, for social variables, uh, conflating uh, terminology, so conflating biological race and socially defined race, uh, overgeneralizing, uh, lacking clinical relevance, uh, lacking inclusivity, promoting uh, racial stereotypes, and contradicting race claims in the text. And I highly recommend uh, that you uh, read this paper online and share it, because I think this is a way forward to fixing race-based medicine. Uh, so, as I said, uh, this has not yet been released. This is from the page proofs, which is why the colors are in red. Uh, it was released uh, online ahead of print March 9th, 2022, and we immediately emailed it to everybody we could. Um, and this is what we heard yesterday uh, in the news release, uh, May 2nd, that the American Academy of Pediatrics said it's putting all its guidance under the microscope. And I think the microscope is a subconscious nod to the pathologist who, who, who had a small voice in this, to eliminate race-based medicine and resulting health disparities. And this is a big deal. This is one of the reasons we chose this particular textbook we could have gone for Nelson's, uh, but by taking something that's associated with society, we had a better opportunity to, to promote change. And this is a further statement from them that they are going to scrutinize the entire catalog, including guidelines, educational materials, textbooks, and newsletter articles. So again, I think this is another, uh, another win for science uh, over small-mindedness. So I'm going to uh, finish up with just a few items on how we can continue to keep things rolling. And I know that you're doing this uh, at UVA. You guys are, are, are a, a really a shining light, uh, I think, in this. As far as building a team, uh, bringing people on board, because you have to have voices, even voices that make you uncomfortable. And my team, as my team has gotten bigger, I've been challenged uh, by, by some of my, my members, my family members, uh, but that helps me to grow. Uh, and don't just consult, hire them, right? We need to hire people. They need to have a voice uh, and a place at the table. And it's also critical to bring in the medical students and the residents because uh, I know as Dr. Legallo knows, uh, the, the medical students and the residents, they are right there on the cutting edge and they are feeling and they are thinking and they are questioning. And for those of us who are, are further along in our careers, you know, it can be very comfortable where we are and we need to be challenged. And so for example, uh, I put up a, um, a Google Doc for my students saying, hey, if you see anything uh, in Robbins that you think is problematic, we're revising it right now. So just you know, put this here. Uh, this has the opportunity for the students to call us in. It is showing my interest in what they have to say as opposed to being called out. And then uh, a big uh, thing is in, when I talk about inclusivity, it's also inclusive images. So at Duke, we use a, a website to teach pathology and we removed uh, race and ethnicity from uh, all of our clinical vignettes in the multiple choice questions, in the website, everything, uh, about a year after I became a course director. But you can see when you look at this, you know, this is a person with uh, lightly pigmented skin, European American. Uh, and what we have now done uh, is to in include uh, images from different uh, skin types. Uh, and the idea here is that you know, this, this patient could be anyone and we want to show the, the range of presentations. And I think this is particularly important. I know those of you uh, who, who have been studying for your step recognize this immediately in the lightly pigmented skin as a basal cell carcinoma. But I think this one in the darker skin looks like a, a melanoma mimic. We've got irregular borders, variation in color. We've got ulceration. So we need to show these things to our students so they can take care of their patients. And we have, we're doing that in Robbins as well. We are uh, including images in multiple skin tones. Uh, finally, since 
race, socially defined race is going to show up, we have to provide context for it. So here, this is looking at factor five Leiden, it refers to the two to 15% of whites. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna get rid of whites because if we use whites, then that means we could be using browns, reds, yellows, and blacks, and we don't wanna go there. Because we know that this particular disease is, is genetic, so an intrinsic cause of disparity, we want to mention European ancestry, but we don't want this to be some sort of code word. You know, when Derek says European ancestry, she means white people. We want to uh, give the students a nudge and remind them that you can actually see this in other American groups because of population admixture. And as you all know, this is particularly important for factor five Leiden because the heterozygotes are also uh, prone to thrombosis. Uh, here is a list of my references. Uh, Dr. Legallo has um, uh, our talk, uh, so you're welcome to look at them there. And uh, we will take questions. I'd like to just, uh, you can find us by email. Uh, we're both on Twitter. Uh, my website, pathologycentral.org, has uh, videos on race and medicine, as well as uh, undergraduate pathology videos. You're all familiar with Diversifying Path. In fact, that was how it was from UVA that I found out about Diversifying Path. And then I would just recommend uh, this uh, website, shirleyworldmd.com. This is an absolutely brilliant cartoonist who's a cardiology fellow uh, at my alma mater, University of Chicago, who has very insightful and incisive comments uh, on race and medicine. Uh, so with that, uh, we will take questions. <laughs>